Hi folks and welcome back. In this video, as I did in the previous video, I'm going to point out another way the evolutionists thought they had something to say about life's origin. And to do that I want to uh, discuss the one, one of the experiments they came up with and I uh, use the term experiment loosely. And this one is called the Miller-Urey experiment. It's what they consider the classic experiment on the origin of life. It was performed in 1952 and it was published in 1953 by Stanley Miller and Harold Urey at the University of Chicago. And this experiment is recorded in arguably every textbook, uh, secular textbook, in all, I would have to say, just about every life science discipline there is. But right off the bat, we have problems here because any attempt to recreate the conditions of a primitive earth or the prebi uh, prebiotic soup, they're purely speculative and hypothetical. Not to mention the problems with their assumptions of the age of the earth in the first place. And I'll have much more to say about the age of the earth in future videos. So even if there was such a time, you can't create, uh, recreate such conditions because you can only guess what they would have been like. So any experimentation of such conditions simply doesn't meet the sci uh, scientific method. And I'll have a lot more to say about the scientific method in the next video. But guess what? Miller and Urey did it anyway, using simulated hypothetical conditions. And if you look at this slide, you'll see the experimental apparatus from their original publication. And in this experiment, they mixed methane, which is CH4, ammonia, which is NH3, hydrogen, which is H2, and our old friend water, H2O, in this circular system of sealed glass tubes and flasks, one of which contained electrodes, which is what they're showing right there. And down here we had water starting off, and they heated that, so they put a flame to that, heated it up to evaporate it, and this forced it into this um, clockwise uh, pattern. Here is the inlet for the gases that they put in. And then sparks were sent through the electrodes to simulate lightning in the presence of all these gases. The water vapor was then cooled, and that's what this is, a cooling system. So it would condense back into a liquid and flow back into the collection flasks flask, singular, I guess. And then down here, what they're showing is uh, that's just like a gooseneck in a, a plumbing design that keeps things from flowing back in the other direction. So this process and this system were left to run continuously over weeks and a reddish goo developed in the collection flask. According to Miller, just turning on the spark in a basic prebiotic experiment will yield 11 out of the 20 essential amino acids. Others who later investigated their products claimed that all 20 essential amino acids were found. They observed that in one week, 10 to 15 percent of the carbon was now in organic compounds. Of the compounds they discovered, 2% of the carbon formed amino acids, while lipids and sugars were also found. So now, from the perspective of the evolutionists, the results of this experiment sound pretty good, don't you think? But, wait for it, as they say, there's a lot more to this story. Beginning with... The critical thing they forgot to tell us is that nucleic acids were not formed. As I pointed out in the Dogma of Molecular Biology videos, DNA is transcribed into RNA, and RNA is translated into proteins. DNA comes first, so just creating amino acids 
still means nothing according to what we observe in life. It means nothing according to science and the data. They also didn't rush to tell you that, as I explained in the Molecular Biology Part 2 video, when amino acids are synthesized or found outside of life, they come in both right-handed and left-handed forms. And in the Miller-Urey experiment, they created both right-handed and left-handed amino acids too, as has every experiment since. And as I explained in life, only left-handed amino acids are used in proteins and no process exists that can isolate, no natural process, that can isolate either the right-handed or left-handed versions. Therefore, there would not have been a discriminatory use of only the left-handed forms from such a mixture. And proteins would have continued both. Uh, proteins would have contained both, I should say, from day one. However, as we know, this is not the case. Only left-handed amino acids are incorporated into proteins. Analysis of the reddish goo that developed yielded more information that they didn't rush to report or expand upon. Although 2% of it was amino acids, almost 85% of it was tar, while almost 13% of it was carboxylic acid. Now, tar and carboxylic acid are toxic to life. So again, the evolutionists have a big problem. Not only that, the amino acids they found readily bound to the tar, the carboxylic acid in the water, but not to each other. That's because, as I explained, they will not self-assemble because they do not have an affinity or an attractive force for one another. And it's the same way with DNA and RNA. DNA nucleotides, RNA nucleotides, and amino acids will not self-assemble. These are the data. All of science knows this. As I already explained, you need each of these several hundred proteins and RNA molecules that are involved in all these processes. Are these processes will not and cannot happen. They must be assembled and linked together with chemical bonds by these other molecules, which would not have been around. All these essential components are required. This is non-negotiable. And without all the necessary parts and machinery for each process of molecular biology, all the several hundred of these uh, molecules, the only option you're left with for the evolution of life to have started back in this supposed prebiotic soup is for DNA, RNA, and amino acids to self-assemble, which we know they do not do. It does not happen. These are the data known by all of science. So please get this. Evolution says that DNA nucleotides, RNA nucleotides, and amino acids did something that they do not do. Although there are numerous problems with the Miller-Urey experiment, it didn't deter others from doing similar experiments. In 1961, another experiment showed that nucleotide A could be created from ammonia and hydrogen cyanide. Nucleotide A is one of the four building blocks of DNA, which I'll tell you more about when we discuss the structure of DNA. Other experiments showed that amino acids could be formed under these conditions, and all the DNA and RNA bases could be created under reducing conditions. Still others showed that using carbon dioxide and water yielded organic compounds. Dr. Jeffrey Beta, who now houses the experiment of Miller and Urey, has done his own experiments that are modified versions of the originals. He correctly noticed that the current models of primitive Earth, which hypothetically contains carbon dioxide and nitrogen, create nitrites, which destroy amino acids as fast as they can form. 
But when he added iron and carbonate minerals to neutralize the nitrites, his products were rich in amino acids. Once again, there are problems with these other experiments that the evolutionists will not discuss. Notice that these other experiments use hydrogen cyanide, reducing conditions, carbon dioxide, or iron and carbonate minerals. So the problem here is that the recipe for prebiotic soup just keeps changing. You just take out a pinch of this and add a dash of that till you get it right. And I guess that explains why Campbell's or Progresso has never been able to market a prebiotic soup alongside their chicken noodle and tomato soups. Hmm. However, all these recipes for, pre for prebiotic soup remain hypothetical because it cannot be observed. Plus, as we already said, creating amino acids and bases still doesn't circumvent the bigger problems, as I've already explained. To create amino acids and bases for DNA and RNA, one thing that is required for all of them is a nitrogen source, because they all contain nitrogen. That's the reason these experiments use ammonia or hydrogen cyanide. They are the nitrogen sources. Therefore, if there was a prebiotic soup, it would have had to have been rich in nitrogen to account for the chemical compositions of amino acids and the nucleotides for DNA and RNA. However, as Jim Brooks said in Origins of Life, the nitrogen content of early organic matter is relatively low just 0.015%. From this, we can be reasonably certain that there never was any substantial amount of primitive soup on Earth when Precambrian sediments were formed. And notice that none of these experiments contain oxygen, as the evolutionists believe primitive Earth would have been void of oxygen. They did not include oxygen in these experiments because life cannot evolve with it. These experiments will not work with oxygen. And this creates another series of problems. First, the data show that our atmosphere has always contained oxygen. According to the evolutionists' own methods of dating the geological layers of sediment, the earliest layers of sediment contain oxygen. As Dr. Philip Abelson explained in 1966, what is the evidence for a primitive methane ammonia atmosphere on Earth? The answer is there is no evidence for it and much against it. Since oxygen is found in what the evolutionists consider the earliest layers, that makes these experiments null and void in the first place. And second, without oxygen, there would also have been no ozone. And ozone blocks out a significant portion of the UV rays from the sun. Ammonia, a constant in these prebiotic soup recipes, is destroyed by UV rays. Therefore, ammonia is not a valid compound to be used in these experiments. And then we have the most obvious issue with having no oxygen on primitive Earth. And although I doubt I really have to explain the problem to you, I will. Life cannot evolve with oxygen, as I already stated, but life cannot evolve without oxygen either. Life must have oxygen. I hope you understand the problem here because this is an insurmountable dilemma for evolution. Life must have oxygen. That's the observable data. You just try holding your breath for 20 or 30 seconds and you'll be reminded of this fact. Life on this planet requires oxygen. So to suggest that the earliest forms of life developed without it is an absurd theory. In the Miller-Urey experiment, as well as the others I mentioned, there's also the issue of an energy source. And they assume the energy for random and spontaneous creation of biomolecules came from a source like lightning or the sun. 
but without a conversion mechanism. The energy from lightning and the sun is destructive, not constructive. Just look at the aftermath of a lightning strike and you'll see how destructive this energy is. Just look around at the buildings, signs, cars, paint, upholstery, fabrics, etc. in your life and you'll see how destructive the sun's energy is. Outside the only natural conversion mechanism that exists for it, namely chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is the only biological molecule, that's the word I'm trying to say, <laughs> the only biological molecule that can harvest the energy of the sun. But chlorophyll would not have been around back then. And chlorophyll is only found in plants. And plants are alive too, you know, so they must also be accounted for, as is the case for every form of life. And they also require carbon dioxide. If you want to claim that chlorophyll produced the energy provided in the prebiotic soup, that means chlorophyll must have been the first biomolecule to evolve. And to compound the problem even further, the first chlorophyll must have, must have evolved without the presence of chlorophyll to convert the energy of the sun into the chemical energy needed to get the job done. So how was the first chlorophyll able to arise? How did it auto assemble? Where were the chloroplasts and the other plant organelles necessary to utilize the energy harvested from the sun? Chlorophyll can't do it all on its own. And then how did we get from plants to animals? Plants have an essence, if you want to call it the opposite form of respiration in their photosynthesis, although they do utilize the process of respiration too. But they take in carbon dioxide and they create oxygen. Animals, however, we take in oxygen and give off carbon dioxide during respiration. The mechanisms, organelles, metabolic pathways, cells, tissues, organs, etc. of these two processes and plants and animals in general are completely different. Despite these many and insurmountable problems, the evolutionists discussed the prebiotic soup as if it was a given, that it was definitely there and that it contained everything necessary to get life started. They cite the Miller-Urey experiment as their proof of chemical evolution and the beginning stated stages of the evolution of life. However, as I've clearly explained, neither of these is accurate. The data do not support either of these claims. You have to understand something here, that if either of those claims were true, the Miller-Urey experiment would be mandatory in every single science class, at every level of education, in every school, college, and university throughout the world. Everyone in science would be performing this experiment. It's a relatively simple experiment to perform, and repeating it would not be a problem. But it's not. So why is that? It's not performed in every science class, at every level of educa uh, education, in every school, college, and university throughout the world because it's not a viable experiment. Not only do the results of this experiment and the others like it not support evolution, they actually cause more problems for evolution. It simply does not provide the answers and the data the evolutionists were looking for, and they know it. So I believe I'm going to end this video here, but come on back for the next video where I'll move on to discuss the scientific method. And if you like what you hear, give me a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much for watching, and as always, we'll leave the light on for you.